Okay, uh, thank you for the intro. Yeah, uh, so we need to forget some things in order to make way for new things, right? But first, I wanted to do a quick intro and a little bit of history of the APK format. Uh, for those of you who maybe um, haven't been with like developing for Android for 10 years. Uh, by the way, my name is Wojtek. I, uh, I'm a developer advocate at Google. Uh, I work with Android and Android Studio uh, to help you developers make better apps. So hopefully you'll be able to learn a thing or two uh, to make your apps a little bit better. OK, so APK, the APK format. Uh, you probably all know it. It's just a zip file. Uh, so I, when I presented this, this talk uh, once at, at, at another conference, I actually had um, the, the full name the, uh, of the acronym APK here, which I found on Wikipedia, and it said it's, it stands for Application Package Kit. When, then I went back to work, and I saw some Android engineers talking about this, and they said they don't really remember what it stands for, so uh, don't trust everything that Wikipedia says, although uh, it's highly probable. Well, it's, anyway, it's an Android package, right? It's a zip file. It contains all the resources that we have in our app, some examples of that are XML resources such as the Android manifest and the contents of the res folder. Uh, we have the resources.arsc, uh, which is like which is a binary file that holds like uh, the the resource table with strings and some other things inside. It tends to get pretty big, by the way. And then there's assets where you can put any file in there. And there we have code. Uh, and there's two types of code in Android apps. That's, there's the Dex code, which is the Java or Kotlin uh, code that you write that gets compiled to, into Dex files. There can be one or more if you reach the Dex limit. And then there's the, the lib folder, which uh, holds any native libraries, so .sos, .dlls, if you use them in your app. And those can also be pretty big. And then there's some metadata that I will discuss a little bit later in the meta uh, in folder. So this hasn't really changed for 10 years now. So this format has been with Android from the very beginning. Uh, so just a quick uh, refresher um, of why this kind of needs to change now, right? And I will talk about that later, about the new format that we've introduced. So this is the part of a resource table of a typical Android app. So at the top, you can see all the configurations that this app supports, which is HDPI screens, XHDPI screens, and so on and so forth. The problem is, when I install it on my uh, Pixel device, it only looks at the resources for, for its own density, right? So it only uses part of the, the, the resource table, the resources available. And all of the rest, uh, all of the other files, is basically space lost. Uh, it um, takes up uh, download size. It takes up disk space. There's nothing that um, good that comes out of this for my device. But it will be used by other devices. And there are many other things uh, that are similar in the APK. So like I said, we have native libraries in the lib folder. But your device is usually either x86 or ARM or ARM64. Um, but usually we, sh we ship all of them, and only, only part of them will be used. Same with other resources on the resource table. So could we optimize that automatically? Could we just uh, remove the files that we're not using when installing the file on our device, get rid of the native libraries, get rid of the other um, density folders from drawables, and so on? Well, theoretically we could because it's a zip file, but the problem is in that um, meta inf folder that I mentioned before, because that's because every APK has to be signed so that no one can tamper with it, so that when you get updates from the Play Store or from some other source, when you install them on your device, um, the system can verify that they have been signed by you, by the developer, uh, the same one who made the app previously, and so that no data is leaked to some third party so that you don't get viruses and so on and so on. And the meta in folder con contains these uh, cryptographic signatures that prevent tampering with, um, with the APK. Um, so funny thing, uh, at some point, actually, you could remove native libraries, and it would still work. But that was actually a security issue. So we fixed it in some ancient version of Android, and you can no longer remove files without changing the signature. Um, OK, so what can we do? So there's this concept called multi-APK. It's been uh, supported by Android and by um, the Play Store for a long time. And what it lets you do is basically uh, prepare smaller APKs that support specific devices, such as devices with MDPI screens and HDPI screens, and split your big, huge APK into these smaller ones uh, 
specifically for a, a specific device. Uh, you can do that. Um, well, first of all, let's start by screen density. This lets us get rid of all the big uh, bitmaps, drawables, and you get X packages. Normally, it's even more than four. It can be like seven or eight. But then you think, OK, but I also have native code, so I would love to split, the, split that up as well, because my native libraries are like 10 megabytes in size. Um, so I want to have uh, specific versions for x86 and ARM7. So now you see the number of your packages that you have to build and manage and upload to the Play Store doubles. And then you know, new Android versions come out, and you think, oh, I want to use this new feature, but I still want to support older devices. So I'm going to have two packages, and one of them is the older one for people with older phones, and this is the new great one using some great new feature. And suddenly, you have you know, 20, 30, 60 uh, APKs that you have to upload to the Play Store. Well, you could do that through the API, so it, there are ways of doing this. But then you get even more possible variations. And the biggest problem really is uh, not just generating them, because you can do that in Android Studio with um, the splits directive. Um, so you can split automatically by density, by ABI. Studio will sp um, spit out all these 60, 90 packages, um, however many you have. However, you still have to manage version codes by hand. And this is hell. Like, if you want to uh, version all of these files, and none of them can have the same version, they have to grow incrementally, and there are various rules that you have to follow in order to have the right files install, uh, installed on the right devices, and suddenly no developer wants to do multi-APK anymore. And so we go back to the big fat APK, and, um, well, users are not happy. Uh, and also notice that um, even though the command is called splits, I actually used quotes. And that's, why, uh, that's because um, when Android Studio introduced this uh, splits directive in the Gradle file, multi-APK, uh, that thing that I just talked about, became known among developers as split APKs because of the name of the directive. But that is completely wrong. Um, and let me tell you why. So in order to actually generate splits and something that we properly call split APKs, there was, for a long time, a, a hidden command, a hidden directive in Android Studio that works together with the splits command called generate pure splits. The problem was we never talked about it because it was not supported by Play Store. Um, it was supported, actually, from Android 5 Lollipop. Uh, it was supported by the framework. And uh, that was about the same time as I joined Google. And one of my first assignments from my manager was, can I go and find out what this split APK business is about and go talk to the Play Store people and see how we can support it? So I was a noogler. I was like, on it. That's going to be the first thing I tell developers. So I went to uh, the Play Store people and asked, do you support split APKs? And they said, no. Are you going to support them? And they said, maybe, not now. Uh, so a year passed, and my manager uh, comes to me and says, so what happened to these split APKs? I'm like, hey, Play, do you support split APKs yet? And we're like, no. Uh, when well you, will you support it? Uh, maybe someday. We're busy. Well, of course, that's not exactly how the conversation went. They were actually super uh, cool, cool people. And to be fair, they were pretty busy. So they were figuring out a lot of other stuff. And so uh, across the, the three years that I worked for Google, we got things like alpha and beta tracks for testing your releases with real users. We got st stage rollouts, so you don't have to roll your app, uh, your update to 100% of users, but you can test on a smaller group. We got store listing experiments. We got universal app campaigns, smaller downloads, faster um, updates. We got the pre-launch reports that tests every APK uh, that you upload on the alpha and beta tracks for errors on uh, multiple devices. And finally, we got Android Vitals lately, which is, uh, helps you uh, figure out performance problems and bugs in your apps. And a lot, lot, lot more. So if you're not using any of those things or you haven't checked them out, please do. So yes, the Play Store people were busy. And actually, it turned out that supporting splits was not an easy thing to implement. Um, contrary to what I thought as a naive noogler back then. So the first time splits were actually used by you developers, probably without you even realizing it, was about the time when Android Studio inst introduced Instant Run. And in order to um, have as fast uh, an install time uh, for, for the emulator for the, for the devices, what Android Studio did is actually figured out which classes changed and which, which resources changed. And instead of pushing the whole APK to the device, it used this um, ADB partial install, which worked 
in tandem with the split APK system to only push the changes to the emulator as you developed. However, that never, um, uh, that never translated to any benefit for your users. It was only for developers to quickly uh, debug and, and rerun an app. Uh, in the meantime, uh, as time passed, app size became a problem. It was steadily going up and uh, not as fast as storage on devices or as fast as internet connections or internet prices. And so at some point, the limit on the Play Store was, was 50 megabytes. Uh, it turns out that some uh, very, very popular apps started reaching that limit and were very afraid of adding new features. And at some point, Play had to raise it to 100 megs. Uh, but developers started getting more and more interested in, in APK size and app size in general. I actually wrote a few articles about that. Um, developers liked it, and so I continued exploring that topic. And around the same time, apps were experimenting a lot with dynamic code loading. The problem was there was no officially supported solution by us, um, by Play or by, by Google. And uh, the problem was that if you're trying to implement dynamic code loading, you will at some point uh, create a security issue. So I'm not saying all apps that did that did it wrong, but there was just so many things you could get wrong, especially as a, as a small developer without a huge security team and so on. So first of all, you had to host that code that you want to load dynamically somewhere. So you had to pull it down from your, from your server. You had to make sure those, those files were secure. And then you had to actually make sure you're downloading uh, what you put on the server and not what someone uh, is trying to send you. So you had to use HTTPS. Well, believe me or not, some, some apps did not do that. They downloaded anything over HTTP. Uh, then you had to roll out your own signing and verification. So I, I told you that APK files are signed, and you can verify their uh, integ integrity. But if you just pull down a DEX file, you would have to do all of that by yourself. Um, and you know what they say, don't roll your own crypto. It's just too easy to make a mistake. And then you would have to make sure that the file you downloaded actually stays secure on the device. Some apps put it on the SD card, so anyone could access it and put their own DEX code there instead and then um, pipe out the um, data of your, of your users somewhere else. And so you had to re-verify it every time you loaded it. So it's, there's just so many problems. However, it's doable, and I will show you later how uh, we solved it. Um, so I said security is important. And so at some point, we also introduced a new app signature scheme for apps uh, called V2. Now, the previous scheme, the, the previous signature, as I, as I showed you, um, had all these hashes for um, all the files in your APK. Um, but what it did is actually it hashed the uncompressed contents of the, uh, of the files. So that whenever you installed a, an APK on your device, if it was, let's say, 100 megs, it had to go and uncompress all of the files just to verify if the installation is correct. Now, the new scheme was not only more secure um, because it was stricter and safer. It verified all bytes in the APK without looking at the files individually. It was also orders of magnitude faster because it didn't have to do this, uh, the compression. It only went through the bytes of the zip file. <clears throat> and last year, we also introduced uh, app signing uh, by Google Play. Uh, now, for years, it was on developers, on you, to manage your own signing keys. Um, you had your private key, you signed the APK, you sent it to play, and then uh, when, that, when your app was downloaded to users' devices, um, the device could verify that it was indeed signed by the same um, private key that you had. However, if you lost that key, if you misplaced it somehow, um, you could not um, sign any new updates, you could not update your app in the Play Store because it would simply not install on user devices anymore. And a few developers um, with a lot of installed did lose, lose their keys, and they came to us, to Google, and they said, can you help us? And we said, no. Well, there's no way for us to recreate that key for you. That's because it's, it's meant to be secure. It's meant to be um, only known to you. Well. Play signing changes that. Um, if you decide to give uh, Google your key, you no longer have to worry that uh, you will lose it. Uh, it will be stored securely and safely for you. And instead, you upload an APK to the Play Store signed using a temporary upload key. Google then strips that key out, replaces it with your um, private key signature, and delivers it to people, uh, to clients' devices. 
So that's great. And actually, around the same time, um, what that led us to was for the first time um, change the contents of the APKs, which we could not do before. As I said, no one without a private key could change anything in, in, in the APKs. And so we had a beta program announced at Google I.O. in 2017 um, of automatic APK optimizations, where we could strip out those native libraries, we could um, strip out some resources, and deliver an optimized APK to your um, users. However, that wasn't ideal. Uh, this never. Um, stuck around for longer. Um, this still used the old multi-APK system. It literally uh, just um, took some files out and delivered the APK. Around that same, same time, uh, we introduced a new concept in the Android app world, which was uh, Android Instant Apps, uh, now called Google Play Instant. And these were basically na uh, native Android apps that users could run on their devices without installing them first. Um, there were some things you had to do with your app, um, such as uh, you had to use runtime permissions, you cannot use some APIs, and then um, the way the user would access an instant app was through a URL. So you had to support deep links and app links specifically, and the app had to be very, very small in order to install um, fast. Um, so it had to be four megabytes or less. By the way, when I say install fast, notice that um, if you use the v, v2 signing that, that we introduced uh, some time back, that installation could be really fast. And that's what enabled this new use case. Uh, that's one of the things that enabled this new use case. Um, so I put the little uh, stars there ne next to supporting app links and 4 megabytes, because actually this year uh, we started a beta program where instant apps can be 10 megabytes or less. And you can actually have URL less instant apps. So you can, if you support an instant app, Without the URL, uh, you can actually start it right from the Play Store page. Next to the Install button, there's a Try Now button. Um, by the way, there's a great session about Instant Apps tomorrow from my colleague uh, Ben Weiss, so I'm not going to go deep into how Instant App works. Uh, uh, work. Uh, however, uh, just, just a quick intro if you've never used it. So normally, you have this big monolithic APK with all the code and resources of your app. However, your app can be composed of multiple screens, multiple features, as we say. Let's say we have a main screen and then a detail screen with, like, let's say, a list of articles. And then if you click on an article, you go and read the actual article or maybe a photo gallery. So if you can refactor your code and separate these features um, on top of a common base where you probably have your networking code, stuff like that, and if you, if you can separate that as a self-contained smaller uh, chunk of your app, you can actually, using a different Gradle plugin, you can build this as, as a feature APK and a base APK. And then you can have more of these. And if any combination of a base APK and a feature APK is less than 4 megs, or 10 megs uh, once we make it official, then you can have an instant app. Um, and it's the first time uh, when, in order to make it easier for developers to reach that 4 megabytes limit, uh, when you could see something like this, if you open your instant app um, artifacts produced by Android Studio, you would not only see your base APK and your feature APK, but you will also see uh, tens of these smaller APKs for different screen densities, uh, different um, CPU architectures, languages, and so on. And when an instant app is actually requested by a client device, what the Play Store would do is it would deliver those base and feature APKs and then pick all the smaller APKs that are required to run on that specific device. Now, how do you enable it for Android Instant Apps? Exactly the command I showed you before, generate pure splits. And this is the first time where splits were actually used and delivered to users' devices to make apps smaller. And the Instant App bundle format um, is nothing else than just a zip container containing all the possible uh, splits that can be put together to be installed as a working app on a user's device. Um, the main thing about this is the splits were generated on your computer, on your development machine, uh, before actually delivering it to the Play Store. So that Play Store didn't change anything. It just got a zip file, then selects a few splits, and delivers them. Uh, the Instant App Bundle format is nothing special, really. It's, it's just a zip file. It doesn't have any, any additional information other than the APKs inside it. So that gets us. Uh, Great, it's halfway through the session, uh, so I finished with the history of the Android APK formats and, and instant apps and so on. Uh, this gets us to the new thing we announced at Google I.O. this year, 
which is the Android App Bundle. And this is a completely new publishing format. And by publishing, uh, I mean this is the thing that you upload to the Play Store. However, uh, it will be used to actually deliver split APKs to clients' devices. Now, the different thing about this bundle um, compared to, for example, the Instant App Bundle is that it actually preserves more information about your project structure, about the modules you have in your, project, uh, in your projects, about the targeting of various assets and code and resources that you have um, that is saved in metadata inside this bundle. And like I said, that is used in combination with um, a service we call Google Play Dynamic Delivery, uh, where Play Store can ingest this Android app bundle and then create and deliver APKs optimized for client devices. And on, L on Android L um, 5.0 and above, where split APKs are um, supported, it actually delivers split APKs, so the smaller possible parts that together will make up the working app. And, but it also supports pre-L devices, where it actually generates a single APK, similar to the multi-APKs that you had to um, prepare by hand previously, and just delivers that to pre-L devices, so everything still works and is also optimized. Um, and it splits by ABI density and language. So that's something you could not do with multi-APK before. And I actually got a question uh, from a friend in the audience today. Why do you do these language splits? Isn't this just like saving a few kilobytes? Well, no. For big apps, uh, this can actually be megabytes of, of savings for um, data transferred and data on device. Um, some of the apps out there have tens and hundreds of translations and thousands of strings, and that's that's not something uh, that can be easily um, just not, not supported by this. So this is great. Now we get all of that automatically. You don't have to uh, worry about version codes, about splits, and so on and so on. So this is how the bundle um, looks like. I took this from our documentation page. And you can see it's a little bit different from, um, th from the APK format or for, from the Instant App bundle. Um, first of all, at the top level, it actually has directories that correspond to the modules that you have in your um, project. Well, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, I will talk about it in a sec. But every, every um, bundle will have this base uh, module. And this is um, where all of your library modules and um, yeah, basically all, all your library modules are put together in a single Android application that's a base module that has all the assets, resources, uh, DEX files, and so on, and, and native libraries, so that Play Store can pick and choose and target the devices from these files. And this gives you basically the size savings. But uh, what we didn't talk much uh, about before at I.O. and up to this point is you can also have these dynamic features here. Uh, and that is the most exciting part about app bundles and dynamic delivery, at least for me. And I will tell you about it in a sec. Uh, but first, how do you actually build a, an app bundle? Let's start with just the size, size savings. Forget the, feature, the dynamic feature module for now. So in order to convert your app into using this new format, you have to build a bundle, enable play signing, because Play Store has to be able to re-sign those split APKs on your behalf, and then upload a bundle. And to do that, literally, instead of building your app with assemble release, you build with bundle release, and you're done. Uh, there are no code changes. You don't have to do anything. Literally just build a bundle, upload it to play, and let uh, dynamic delivery do its part. So that's great. Um, in case you don't want play to split on some of these dimensions, let's say your languages aren't as big as I said, and maybe there's no point for users to have to have internet in order to change languages, because um, if they only get one split with one language when they change the, the language or the device, well, they need, they need a connection to download the new one. Maybe you want to disable that. You can do it. Um, instead of using the splits directive, you use the new bundle one. OK, so there is a little bit of configuration involved if you want to, but it's not needed. So let's talk about dynamic features. Uh, this is the most exciting thing. So dynamic features are features AP, feature APKs that you can build from your project that are installed on demand um, whenever your app needs them. So they're not installed with, as part of the base APKs. They're not installed when the user presses install in the Play Store. Um, your app can be smaller, but can still uh, specify code that can be loaded on demand. So this is the dynamic code loading and resource loading that I mentioned before. 
So to build those, you have to have a module in your uh, Android Studio project that applies the, the dynamic feature Android uh, Gradle plugin. And it has some special metadata in the manifest that lets the build system know that it's uh, to be loaded on demand. It has a title, and um, it has a split name. Um, and that split name is actually um, that folder name where it will uh, it'll reside in the app bundle. So how do you actually use those? How do you then do the dynamic code loading? And how do you pull them down from, from the Play Store? There's a new library, a new SDK, you might call it, called the PlayCore library. And it includes two, well, two most important parts that you, as develop developers, will probably interact with. One is the split install manager, and the other is split compact. So first of all, um, in order to request installation of these on-demand features, you use the split install manager. It's a pretty simple API. You specify uh, which splits you want to install. So these are the names from the manifest that I specified before. And you ask it, ask it to start installation. Now, there is a lot of callbacks here that you get um, to be able to uh, watch installation, pro uh, download progress, installation progress. You might get failures if there's no internet, and so on. Um, I will not cover all of these. This is a pretty simple API, and we do have a sample for that that I will show you later. Um, but the impor important part is um, the other thing you have to do is to use split compat. Uh, so in your application object, uh, you can either um, um, subclass the split compat application, or if you're already using your own, sub, uh, your own custom class, you simply have to install split compat. And then once you load a dynamic feature, there are just a few rules that you have to observe in order to be able to access the resources and the code contained in that dynamic feature. Um, so for example, to load any uh, new assets that are brought in with the APK that you just installed using the split install helper, uh, you have to remember to always create a new context. Uh, simply recreate a new context. From that, you can get an asset manager. And that asset manager will be aware of the new files that have been installed with the new split. Um, similarly, for accessing any native libraries, so the SO files, the LL files, that have been installed as part of a, of a new split that was installed on demand, uh, you simply have to load the library using split install helper load library. So previously, you probably had system.load library. Just replace that with split install helper. It will make sure all the paths um, from the new APKs are involved in, the, in this um, load operation. And then you can simply use it. It gets a little bit more complicated, or actually a lot more complicated, if you want to access DEX code that you just loaded uh, using the um, splits. Um, so the basic answer is, you have to use reflection because your base module probably doesn't know anything about the classes and interfaces that are in the new split. So if you want to access something from there, you probably have to use uh, reflection, get the class, get the methods, and call them. However, when playing with this for the past few days, I figured out a few ways that made it easier for me. And I'm sure you as developers and we as we, as we go, as we have this um, functionality available to us, we will come up with better patterns. But for now, um, let me show you three ways that I used it. So first of all, if the code that you need to access isn't actually uh, an Android module, if it can be refactored as a pure Java module or Kotlin module that doesn't access any Android APIs, that doesn't have to be compiled with the Android Gradle plugin, you can simply refactor it to a separate module. Uh, your dynamic feature will depend on that module. The dynamic feature can be empty. There can be nothing inside, but it will depend on it as an imp implementation. And then you can, from your app, you can depend on that Java-only module using the compile-only keyword, which means it will be available at compile time. So you get code completion. You don't have to like, use the reflection. The ID and the compiler know about the classes which are um, in that library. However, uh, compile-only means they do not get included in the base APK. They stay where they are. They are only packaged with the, with the dynamic feature, and they will be loaded on demand. So if you can do that, if you have a Java-only library um, or a Kotlin-only library, um, then you can use that. It gets more complicated where you actually have to use the Android Gradle plugin. And that's because compile-only is, um, is not supported when depending on Android libraries. So in that case, you could think of something like this. If there's some kind of interface that you can extract uh, from the, the, the classes that you'll be interacting with, 
why not include that interface in your base module? It'll literally be an, an interface, so no method bodies, no code, nothing. It's, it doesn't weigh much. And then have a class in the dynamic feature implement that interface. Uh, so that, yes, you do have to do reflection. You will have to um, invoke, uh, create the, an instance of that class uh, using reflection, probably. But then at least you can cast it to your interface and use it um, normally as, as you would from your code. Um, so that's one solution. And then uh, remember how I told you in the case of instant apps, when you refactor your app into separate features, often they're separate screens of your app, so separate uh, flows that are started from an activity or a fragment and are self-contained parts of your app. If, if that's the case with your dynamic feature, if you're uh, literally loading on demand some part of, of your app that's a self-contained screen, you can just launch it through an intent. And an intent doesn't have to know anything about the classes inside, about the methods, and so on. And so on. Um, just remember that you have to uh, use the version of, uh, of the um, creation of the intent where you uh, provide a string and not a dot class, because the IDE will not let you, uh, will not see that class. So if you can just start, a, start that intent, um, then the, the, the new activity from the new module will take over, and there will be no um, cross-module uh, calls. So great. Uh, these are just some of the ways you can do that. Um, there is a sample on our Google Samples page uh, called Android Dynamic Features. It actually uses the, only the intent way of doing things. So everything is a separate activity. It's launched by intent. Uh, but you can um, use it as a starting point and maybe experiment on your, on your own. So I really encourage you to, to look into that. And um, there's a few other things I wanted to mention. So obviously, this is a new format. And Google Play does all these crazy things about optimizing APKs. But how can you test locally? How can you be sure that uh, what your APK, uh, sorry, what your bundle will pr produce are the right APKs and so on? Um, there's an open source tool called Bundle Tool, which is actually used by Play. Uh, to generate the APKs. Then you can run locally on your devices. You can take a bundle and uh, tell Bundle Tool to generate all the split APKs and then look into them. Uh, you can even install them on devices locally. Uh, you can even ask Bundle Tool to get a configuration of a device you have connected uh, via ADB and save that to a JSON file and then generate all the APKs just for that device. So you can test locally. It's great. And then uh, one more thing, um, if you want to test, especially if you want to test dynamic features, but not only, uh, there's a new internal testing track, similar to the alpha and beta channels on Play Store. Uh, however, this is, um, this is meant only for you, for your development team. You don't uh, give that out to uh, testers out in the field. But what it gives you is it gives you instantaneous updates, so that whenever you upload something to Play, uh, you will see an update dialog in your, on your device um, in the Play Store within, let's say, 10 seconds of you uploading it. Um, and by the way, you might have noticed um, I'm presenting from a Pixel book, and I was, I, th this is actually the only device I brought here. And I was still iterating on my slides and on my code, testing out various scenarios right before my talk. And the thing about the Pixel book is, right now, uh, Android Studio and Android support is in early, um, in early stages. So this is on development channel. And it doesn't support ADB, so I couldn't test on my device. And it doesn't support running the emulator, so I couldn't test on the emulator. So what I did instead, I just used the internal testing track. And actually, I had this um, change code, upload to Play Store, and then up, uh, update on my device uh, kind of development cycle. And it worked great. I didn't have to wait more than 10 seconds for the updates to happen. Um, so since we still have five more minutes, maybe I can show you some demos. Uh, what can we start with? OK, so for example, this is the sample I showed you on GitHub. This is, uh, this is running here on the, on the uh, Android support on, on the Chrome OS. And um, yeah, the sample doesn't do much, but it lets you um, start things on demand. Do I have internet? I do. OK, so let's try that. Let's see how this can look. Um, now, if I press this, a new package will be downloaded from Play Store, installed transparently uh, to the user uh, without killing the app, without restarting it, and a new activity taken from that bundle will be started. And live demos tend to crash and burn, so let's hope this works. Starting install, downloading, installing, bam. 
So this was installation on demand, new code pulled down from the Play Store and um, run normally as part of our running app. Same here with a Kotlin sample, and we can also start native, um, native code from native libraries. So this is a, a JNI running from a, a library pulled down from the Play Store. And we can even load some um, APK that contains some large assets, in this case, this huge text. Um, so yeah, this works. You can play with this. Um, just remember that um, in order to test this sample, like I just did, you would have to up, uh, change the package name and upload it to your own uh, Play develop developer console in order to have uh, Play be uh, being able to deliver these um, to you. OK, so there was this sample. Now, I wanted to show you the um, internal testing track. So here I have my Sudoku sample app that I've been working in my spare time. And uh, so I built a new bundle. I incremented the version code. I built the bundle so we don't have to wait for it. Um, and I uploaded it to the internal track. Let's go. Let's see. App releases. There's a new track here, internal test track. Edit release. I started preparing it. So there's my bundle. Um, so the currently published one has version code 8. I uploaded version code 9. By the way, there's some pretty cool stuff you can do here with bundles on the Play Store. Uh, you can explore app bundles. You can see uh, and download all the APKs that would be generated by the Play Store from that bundle. Uh, you can see the size savings for your app um, before using the bundle and after you start using it. And you can even uh, download device-specific APKs. So if I, for example, search for a Pixel 2, I could download the, a zip file containing the specific APKs that would be installed on my device. So this is great. You can either use Bundle Tool or you can use this if you want to uh, have more visibility into the APKs um, that are generated. OK, but let's go back. Um, version name, release, review. OK, so here's my Play Store. And here's my Sudoku app. It doesn't have any updates yet. And let's hope this works. Start, start rollout. Oh, yeah, very important thing. Uh, dynamic features are currently in beta, so this warns me right now that I will not be able to publish my app um, publicly as in, pr in the production channel. Uh, so right now you can test it in the internal testing track and your alpha and beta channels, but you cannot roll it out to your users. Okay, so I agree to that. I confirm, starting rollout, and let's hope this works. Okay, so it's published, and now we wait. <laughs> Check if there are any updates. Oh, something else has updates. OK, let's give it five more seconds. And <laughs> of course, it worked every time before. Nope. Well, let's, let's go ahead and see in, in a few more seconds. Uh, okay, uh, anything else I wanted to show you here? Um, oh, yeah, we also added uh, very pre preliminary um, bundle support in the APK analyzer. So you can drag a bundle from, let's see, where's my bundle here? Uh, so you can drag a bundle and see it here. However, it's not fully supported yet. Uh, you can explore some things like the text code. Um, but you will probably not be able to see resources, and you will not be able to preview the um, new PB files format. So we're looking into that. Uh, what you can do instead, as I said, you can use Bundle Tool to, to generate a zip file containing all the APKs uh, that will be produced by your um, uh, bundle, and then look into that. And let's see. Did I forget to click something in the Play Console? Well, I'm sorry, guys, but no, 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 no. I tried that literally 10 times today when I was developing. Maybe it was already updated. Well, one of the demos had to not work. <laughs> sorry? Scroll up where? Ah, yes. There we go. 
I was probably here all the time. That's, that's me. <laughs> By the way, um, just today, so like I said, uh, migrating to an up bundle uh, is just a few seconds. Uh, but just today, uh, before the talk, I also managed to uh, actually do the whole Sudoku board generation as a um, dynamic app, uh, as a dynamic uh, loaded module. So if you might notice, if I now press generate, Play Store should do a thingy or not. Well, the demo gods don't like me today. Anyway, uh, so what I did was, as soon as you install the app, you get only one Sudoku board um, that's pre-generated and it, there's no like Sudoku generation code. Um, once the player play, uh, selects generate, they wait for five seconds, uh, a new module is installed, and they get infinite uh, board generation. So um, that's just one use case. Uh, however, let's, okay, let's close the demos. They were not very successful. Well, let's, uh, let's go back to the slide, and this is the finishing slide. So in the future, so this is very early days for um, app bundles and dynamic delivery. However, um, in the future, we might see um, app bundles converge with instant apps. So we could imagine instant apps, um, uh, you being able to upload a single bundle um, that has both an instant app and a um, and your normal installable app in it. Um, we might see other types of splits and optimizations uh, so that not only ABI density and language will, would be supported. Uh, you could imagine having different textures for different um, devices supporting different OpenGL versions and so on and so on. Um, one thing that doesn't work with uh, app bundles right now is APK expansion files. So that is something also um, uh, that's important for games. And we are looking into how we can make it work together or in a similar way as it used to before. And possibly, I'm not saying this will come, but possibly uh, having Google Play signing might enable signing key rotation in the future in case your key uh, gets compromised. And I'd love to hear what else you would like to see uh, um, with Android app bundles and dynamic delivery. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, let's talk later.